I've wanted to be a filmmaker pretty much my whole life. So the first time I ever went to Los Angeles, the first place I went was obviously the La Brea Tar Pits. Clearly my nerddom trumps my filmmaker dumb. The Tar Pits are awesome, by the way. If you ever get a chance to go, do it, definitely. It's, 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 it's a really cool insight into a specific time in history when humans were around, but there were still monsters. Like you go to a museum and you see a T-Rex skeleton and that's cool, mind blowing, all that, you know, but, but you also know that that was like way before humans. Like none of these things ever ate a human. No human ever interacted with any of these things. No human being ever laid eyes on these things. But Smilodon, saber tooth cats, you're carrying genes from someone who got eaten by one of those. And the mammoths they found there and the, the giant sloths, those were hunted by human beings, just like you and me. Like some people theorize that the reason that children fantasize about monsters and see monsters in their closet and under the bed and stuff like that is from just instinctual genetic stuff that's been handed down for thousands of generations that came from that time period when there really were monsters to be afraid of. I don't know if that's been proven, but it's an interesting concept. And today genetic science is advanced to the point that maybe, maybe we could bring some of these creatures back. But is this a good idea? Or is it a great idea? In 1507, Portuguese sailors landed on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, and it was there that they came across the dodo bird. And the sailors thought this bird was hilarious. It, it couldn't fly, it was weird and round and awkward, and when it tried to run away, it would wobble and drag its belly on the ground. Yeah, the dodo didn't have any defenses against predators because there weren't any on the island, and this made the sailors think it was kind of dumb and lazy. That can happen. That's why I made a predator clone. Now I'm in the best shape of my life and my mind sharper than ever. Thanks, Predator clone. But back to the dodo. Over the years, ships from other countries started to show up, like Britain and the Netherlands, and they found the dodo to be amusing as well, but they also found it to be, well, delicious. They were easy to hunt and they probably tasted like chicken, and when their food supplies went low, well, dodo was on the menu. The Dutch ended up colonizing Mauritius in 1644, and they brought with them other animals like cats, dogs, pigs, and monkeys. These animals invaded the woods where the dodo lived. They'd wind up trampling or eating the bird's eggs and the young. And due to all of the above, the dodo went into complete extinction in 1681. This is an example of a man-caused extinction. But there's a company that wants to reverse this error, and they're called Colossal Biosciences. Their theory is that by rewilding extinct species, they could improve or restore habitats that have missed the animals over the years. As CEO Ben Lamb told Dallas Innovates in January 2023, quote, Our guiding vision is to restore extinct species and protect endangered species that play integral roles within their ecosystems. Returning extinct keystone species to their original habitats can help restore ecosystems impoverished by their absence and add to biodiversity. And they're not stopping with the dodo. They also want to revive the woolly mammoth and the Tasmanian tiger. But that brings up a good question, like what are the pros and cons of bringing back animals from extinction? I mean, we know the cons. <laughs> the cons being, of course, that they could ruin our kitchens. But what about the pros? I mean, outside of it just being cool to maybe, you know, see one in a zoo or something like that, could they actually restore lost ecosystems or bring nature back into balance? And maybe even more interesting, is there some great new advancement that we could learn along the way? Let's start by defining exactly what we mean by extinction. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, extinction occurs when a species is diminished because of environmental forces like global change, natural disasters, overexploitation, or habitat fragmentation. A species can also go extinct because of evolutionary changes like poor reproduction, genetic inbreeding, or just a general decline in population numbers. A decline all the way down to zero, presumably. It's estimated that dozens of species go extinct every day, by 2050, 30 to 50% of all species may be extinct. Yeah, they don't call this the sixth great extinction for nothing. So if we're gonna bring back extinct species, it feels like we should have some very specific criteria in place. So what kind of criteria can we use to justify bringing animals back? 
One of the first criteria to consider is just, you know, how easily a species can be brought back to life. Now this depends on several things, but maybe the most important is just the simple, how long has this species been gone? Because the further along it's been gone, the less likely we are to find an intact genome. Yeah, DNA's limit of survival is around a million years, so we probably have a better chance of bringing sexy back than the dinosaurs. And yeah, I researched this, sexy went extinct in 2015. Now, a second consideration is determining whether or not the original cause of extinction could be avoided this next time around, because there's no use bringing them back if they're just going to go extinct again. For example, the southern gastric brooding frog went extinct because of a chytrid fungus. So if it was revived, it's possible that same fungus could kill it off again. And then you have to think about if, you know, humans caused these animals to go extinct because, uh, I mean, we're, we're not really known for correcting our bad behavior, so who's to say we won't wipe it out again? The third thing is that there should be some kind of consideration for whether or not there's an availability of the species' natural habitat. As Professor of History Dolly Jurgensen wrote in a paper published in Bioscience in 2013, quote, The International Union for Conservation of Nature developed guidelines that suggest background studies to allow identification of species' habitat requirements. Evaluation of potential sites within the former range of the species should be addressed before reintroduction proceeds. And a fourth criterion should consider the impact this species would have on the environment where it will be reintroduced. I mean, we assume it would be positive, but what if it's not? I mean, if you think about it, it would be kind of the ultimate invasive species. It would be an invasive species across time. Just kind of a wild thought. All of this depends, of course, on whether or not we can actually do this. So how would de-extinction work? In a lot of ways, it's basically just like cloning. And yeah, we can clone an animal if we have well-preserved cells with intact nuclei, and then those cells can grow in a petri dish, and through a little science magic, we can make them act like embryonic cells. Since the cell's nucleus has genomic DNA, we can transfer an intact nucleus into a donor's egg whose nucleus has been removed. And then we can implant that egg into a surrogate mother and hope that it grows into a healthy baby. Both the donor egg and the surrogate mom would have to be from closely related living species. And this has totally been done before. It was actually first done in 2003 with a Pyrian ibex. Um, they were able to do it with some frozen skin samples. It worked, but it did die within minutes after birth. But a healthy Javan Banting calf was cloned from a frozen skin sample later that year. Uh, the Banting isn't extinct, but the experiment showed that de-extinction through cloning is possible. And there are a few different companies working on de-extinction projects. One of them is called Revive and Restore out of California. They're a wildlife conservation group that uses biotechnology for conservation practices. And according to its website, their vision is to, quote, revive biodiversity and restore ecosystems for millennia to come. Yeah, the company had its first public meeting on de-extinction in 2013. Uh, the woolly mammoth and passenger pigeon would be the first on their list. For the woolly mammoth, they talked about combining a whole suite of technologies, including bioengineering, cellular resources, genome research, and reproductive techniques. And they're applying similar tools to the passenger pigeon, but their main focus is on endangered species that need genetic rescue, like the Blackfoot ferret and Shavalsky's horse. In 2021, they handed off their mammoth project to another company, Colossal Biosciences. Actually, Colossal is based right here in, in Dallas, right here in my backyard. And yeah, they've gotten a lot of press lately ever since they said that they were gonna revive the woolly mammoth. But we gotta back up for a second because what Colossal wants to create is not gonna be a true woolly mammoth. According to their website, it will be, quote, more specifically, a cold-resistant elephant with all the core biological traits of the woolly mammoth. It'll walk like a woolly mammoth, it'll look like one, sound like one, but most importantly, it'll be able to inhabit the same ecosystem previously abandoned by the mammoth's extinction. Yeah, the DNA in a woolly mammoth is 99.6% identical to an Asian elephant. That's according to the Mammoth Genome Project. And to fill that last 0.4% gap, colossal scientists are using CRISPR genome editing. And according to them, the DNA sequence differences shouldn't matter that much, and it won't affect the proteins produced. So yeah, like Colossal said, they're not really looking to recreate 100% accurate woolly mammoth. They're just kind of modifying an Asian elephant's DNA to produce a hybrid animal with mammoth-like traits. But yeah, even with all the technology at our disposal today, we're still looking at like 10 years out before we see a hybrid woolly mammoth. Colossal has several goals for reviving the woolly mammoth, including slowing down the melting of the Arctic permafrost, drive advancement in multiplex genome editing, and saving modern elephants from extinction. So there are a lot of good reasons to do this. We talked about the pros earlier, but there's still the big question of whether it's ethical or not. Like there are some scientists that argue that it would be a lot more beneficial to focus on preventing extinction, that we should focus our efforts on climate change and pollution and habitat destruction and overharvesting. As scientist Paul and Ann Ehrlich wrote in Yale Environment 360 in 2014, quote, Spending millions of dollars to try to de-extinct a few species will not compensate for the thousands of populations and species that have been lost due to human activities, to say nothing of restoring the natural functions of their former habitats. They go on to suggest that the reintroduction of surviving endangered species is already a pretty intensive effort, um, and that more should be allocated to that than in 
laboratory created resurrections. Humans are constantly transforming Earth, so reintroducing an extinct species may not be successful at all. And there are other risks, like possibly some species could turn out to carry plagues or retroviruses in their genomes. Yeah, that's what we need, another plague. But for the Ehrlichs, the biggest problem is what they call the moral hazard. That's actually a term from economics for when someone's more willing to take a risk when others will be responsible for the costs. And yeah, for some scientists, the moral hazard just far outweighs the benefits. And instead, we should be focusing on reducing our impact on the environment. Somebody who's looked really deeply into the issue of de-extinction is Beth Shapiro, who's a biologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's also the author of How to Clone a Mammoth, The Science of De-Extinction. In an interview with Smithsonian Magazine in 2015, she suggested that de-extinction might not be the right answer for our biodiversity crisis. But the technologies being developed for de-extinction could become new tools for conservation efforts. As she told the Smithsonian, quote, why not provide populations a little bit of genomic assistance so they can survive in a world that's changing too quickly for natural evolutionary processes to keep up? You know, there's that famous quote from Jurassic Park that says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. But for some of the anti-de-extinction scientists, which kind of makes it sound like they're pro-extinction, but anyway, a more fitting quote for um, the subject might actually come from the third movie, which is, some of the worst things imaginable have been done with the best intentions. But maybe not. You know, like Beth Shapiro said, de-extinction progress could help with other species, including ourselves, as we survive in an increasingly hostile world. One really cool example of this came from the University of Pennsylvania's Machine Biology Group. They recently resurrected molecules with antibiotic properties, and they got it from our extinct relatives, the Neanderthals and Denisovians. Yeah, this is a new thing called molecular de-extinction. What they did was they sequenced genome data collected from bones and artifacts from Neanderthals and Denisovians, and then they trained an AI model to predict which molecules would make the most effective antibiotics. They then created those molecules in the lab and tested them on mice, and they found that the molecules were great at fighting off bacterial infections. If these tests are clinically successful in human, this could be a watershed moment because we actually desperately need new antibiotics right now. As you probably know, antibiotic-resistant bacteria has become a bit of a problem. In fact, a UN report in 2019 said that the death toll from drug-resistant infections may rise to 10 million by 2050 if we don't solve the problem soon. Seriously, who would have thought that reviving a woolly mammoth would lead to solutions for antibiotic-resistant bacteria? And those are just the potential spin-off benefits that we can think of. I mean, who knows what kind of breakthroughs would come out of it? And honestly, for me, that's a good enough reason to go for it. I mean, I make this argument about the space program all the time, that our lives are immeasurably better because of the spin-off technologies that came from the space program. And that's why I'm generally, not always, but generally, in favor of these kinds of big scientific swings, you know? You just never know what kind of amazing things could come out of it. I mean, really, what bad thing could possibly come from DNA editing and cloning technology? <laughs> <laughs> Predator claw was a bad idea. You can't escape him. He follows you everywhere. Just like online spammers and marketers. Every time you buy something, they get your information, they put it in a database and then sell it to other online marketers and scammers. And then they just hound you with emails and phone calls. They're relentless. Thankfully, there's somebody on your side who's just as relentless, and that's Incogni. What Incogni does is they reach out to all those data brokers that keep your information online and then sell your information around to everybody without you knowing. It sounds like it should be illegal and I don't know, maybe it should be, but it's not. In fact, it's big business. That's why you can't escape them. They just keep selling your information around all over the place over and over again. But here's the thing. They're required by law to take your information out of their databases if you ask them to. The problem is there's hundreds of them. There's no way you could possibly reach out to all of them at once. That's where Incogni comes in. They contact the data brokers on your behalf. And if they find out that your information is on a database, they issue a removal request. And then they just keep calling and calling. They won't stop until your name is off the database. And then they keep monitoring it. So if it winds up back on a database somewhere, they'll squash it before it spreads again. By the way, it's not just harassing phone calls and emails. These databases can get you into real trouble. Cyber criminals can hack into them and steal your identity. Some people have had huge loans taken out in their name without their knowledge. Oh, and they can also sell your information to these things called people search sites. These are public databases that literally anybody can access. Anybody can get access to your info. Don't think about that too much if you want to sleep at night. But Incogni can put a stop to it. I've been using it for a while now and I can vouch for it. It works. So go to incogni.com or the link down below. Enter Joe Scott at checkout and get 60% off an annual plan. Make 2024 the year you finally escape from online spammers. 
Go to incognito.com slash Joe Scott to get started. <laughs> Zoe! You saved me! That's a good girl! Good girl! Hey, let's go finish the video. That was close. All right, thank you so much for watching. Now go down below and tell me what species you'd like to see brought back. I wanna see some real fights over this. Come on, go do it. Real quick, I wanna thank some of our newest Patreon supporters. We've got Dave Schmenecki, uh, Gail McQueen, Richard Williams, Krista Morgan, Nylin, and Peter Antill. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you'd like to join them, get early access to videos and all the cool stuff, and just be part of a really awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, so this is actually the last video of the year, and I just want to say thank you to all of you from the bottom of my heart for sticking with me this year. Uh, it's been a year of big changes. <laughs> That, that you can see and a lot of them that you can't see. We got some really cool stuff on the way for 2024 and I can't wait to share it with you. And whatever holiday you celebrate, I hope you have a great one. Um, I believe this video is coming out on Christmas Day. So if you're guzzling egg dog while watching this, Merry Christmas. So now I'm gonna go share my Christmas with my savior, Zoe. Yeah, that's you, you're my savior. You showed that predator clone who's the biggest predator in this house, didn't you? That's you. You're the biggest predator in this house. Ah!